Hi YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark and I'm going to uh, continue reading from uh, Population Control Through Nuclear Pollution by Tamplin and Goffman, Chapter 2, uh, titled Biological Effects of Radiation. And we're on the subchapter that says General Laws of Cancer Induction by Radiation. We can now summarize the general laws for cancer production by radiation of human beings, including the evidence for infants in utero, children, and adults. <clears throat> Law 1. All forms of cancer in all probability can be increased by ionizing radiation. And the correct way to describe the phenomenon is either in terms of the dose required to double the spontaneous incidence rate for each cancer, or alternatively, as the increase of incidence of such cancers per rat of exposure. Law 2. All forms of cancer show closely similar doubling doses and closely similar increases in incident rate per rad. Law 3. Youthful subjects require less radiation to increase the incidence of rate by a specified fraction than do adults. Let me read that again. Youthful subjects require less radiation to increase the incidence rate by a specified fraction than do adults. Based upon these laws and the extensive data already in hand and described above, the following assignments appear reasonable for all forms of cancer and leukemia. For adults, 50 rads to double the spontaneous cancer and leukemia incidence. 2% increase in incident rate per rad of exposure. Wow. For children, between 5 and 10 rads to double spontaneous incidence. 10 to 20% increase in incident rate per rad of exposure. For infants in utero, between 1 third and 1 and a half rads to double spontaneous incidence. 600 to 300% in incidence rate per rat of exposure. Wow, this explains the skyrocketing cancer rates right now. <clears throat> For the radiation of infants in utero, Stewart and Neal had clearly stated the outlines of these general laws. For adults, Port, Brown, and Dahl had clearly stated the outlines of these general laws. With all of the additional data available, plus the data of Stewart and Neal, McMahon and Court Brown and Dahl, we consider the enunciation of these general fundamental laws as having a better experimental base than many laws of physics, chemistry, or even biology when had when they were first proposed. Wow. Furthermore, we would estimate that the absolute numbers, if anything, are probably underestimating the risk. For purposes of setting radiation tolerance guidelines, one might even be advised to use lower doubling doses than those estimated above. Wow. The implications of these laws for the population exposure associated with Adams for Peace programs. The statutory allowable dose to the population at large in the USA is 0.17 rads per year from peaceful uses of atomic energy in all forms. If everyone in the population were to receive 0.17 rads per year from birth to 30 years, the integrated exposure above background would be 5 rads of exposure. If the risk for all forms of cancer plus leukemia is an increase of 2% in incidence per rad, we have 5 times 2, which equals 10% increase in incident rate of all forms of cancer plus leukemia per year for a population of 200 million persons in the USA. And this estimate does not even credit the much greater sensitivity to cancer induction of the radiated child or infant in utero. Our estimate of 32,000 extra cancers and leukemia is probably too low as a result of not taking the child sensitivity into account. 
and 32,000 extra cancer plus leukemia cases per year exceeds by far the mortality rate from the highest mortality year in the Vietnam War. Hmm. And yet nobody really flips out at that. It seems to us that this alone is rather a high price to consider as being compatible with the benefits to be derived from the orderly development of atomic energy. And we must add to these death estimates the comment that we have only used the hard data in hand based upon cancer and leukemia induced in humans by radiation. We have said nothing thus far of the additional burden of loss of life and misery from genetic disorders in future generations, fetal deaths, and neonatal deaths. Furthermore, we have not used the vast array of experimental animal data which indicate that not only does cancer mortality increase from irradiation, but that many, if not all, causes of death increase, and in about the same proportion as does cancer mortality. Hmm. In human beings, this could simply, in human beings, this could multiply by four times the 32,000 extra cancer plus leukemia deaths per year in the United States. Wow. What must be done? It would appear that the only sensible thing to do right now is to reduce drastically the Federal Radiation Council radiation dosage guidelines, guidelines which permit excessive radiation dosages to the population. We draw no comfort from the fact that everyone in the population is not yet receiving this allowable dosage. With the variety of burgeoning atomic energy programs, an increasing proportion of the population will indeed receive increasing doses of radiation. Delivery of even a small fraction of the dosage currently legal would be an unspeakable tragedy, tragedy in view of the absence of any justification for such an irresponsible act. Well, they did it, and it's done. This, in essence, is the evidence and message we delivered before the Eminent Scientific Society, the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, on October 29, 1969, in San Francisco, California. Wow, I was in eighth grade in 1969. <coughs> and this was the message we repeated on November 18, 1969 to the Senate Subcommittee on Air and Water Pollution, which was holding hearings on matter related to the hazards of radiation from various atomic energy programs. Holy fuck. And in those presentations, we urged the Atomic Energy Commission to join us in the effort to achieve a, matter, a much safer set of federal radiation guidelines. The Atomic Energy Commission did not join us. No shit, Sherlock. Instead, the staff of the AEC criticized where we had presented our findings, when we had presented our findings, and to whom we had presented our findings. None of these criticisms even dealt even remotely with the issue at hand, namely the grave hazard to the public health. We felt it was urgent for everyone to know whether the Atomic Energy Commission had any desire to get the truth out of our findings. We were anxious for the best scientists in the country to go over our scientific evidence with a fine-toothed comb to criticize our evidence and to ask us for any questions they wished. On January 28, 1970, we were presenting the evidence described above, plus a great deal of additional confirmatory evidence based upon even further study at the hearing of the Joint Committee Atomic and on atomic energy. The Joint Committee on Atomic Energy. Oh, that's the secret ones. That's joint, the Joint Committee of Anything inside the United States is a super secret thing. In the halls of Congress on that date, we were issued the following invitation to the Atomic Energy Commission. A scientific challenge to the Atomic Energy Commission staff concerning the cancer leukemia risk from radiation. J. 
Chairman Hollifield, we urge you to nominate a jury of eminent persons, physicists, chemists, biologists, physicians, Nobel Prize winners, or National Academy of Science members, or American Society for Advancement of Science members, none of whom have any atomic energy axe to grind. We urge you to serve as chairman of a debate. Dr. Tamplin and I will debate each other in every facet of evidence concerning the serious hazard of Federal Radiation Council guidelines against the entire AEC staff, plus anyone they can get from their 19 odd laboratories, singly, serially, or in any combination. With their 20 year background on this problem, and their large staff to draw, and they should be razor sharp at a moment's notice. We are ready now. If there is a valid reason for questioning our submission to peers and for questioning our evidence, this eminent jury of peers will certainly determine so. If the debate before the eminent peers is not held, then by default, we think the entire country and the world will know the answer without further question. That was January 28, 1970. It is now the latter part of 1970. The AEC, the AEC staff has not been heard from. It appears if the true answer, it appears as if the true answer is known by the AEC by default. I see what they did. We issued the following invitation. In the halls of Congress on that date, we issued the following invitation to the Atomic Energy Commission. I wonder. If they, I wish they had told us where they had it. So let me see how. I'm at 11 minutes. Let me see what do we have. The next thing is genetic consequences of radiation. That's a pretty long topic. I think I'll stop here, you guys. We're on page 21. The next subchapter is genetic consequences of radiation. And um, so I guess I'll talk to you guys tomorrow night. And I think this is very enlightening. I hope you guys are getting something out of it. I'm shocked if you can't tell as I'm reading. Um, it's pretty evident they know what they're doing. I don't think they do know what they're doing at, at Fukushima, however. I think Fukushima is completely beyond anything that they... I think they actually had the hubris to think that they could manage it. And now that they can't, they're just going to like... Mm. Zip the mouth, calladito, let's not tell anybody anything, and we didn't do anything. And they have all the laws and all the money to protect them. And so we get to protect ourselves, and we get to help ourselves. And hopefully, reading this book, I know it's slow, but it's better than not reading it. That's what I think. Ciao, you guys. Sweet dreams.